The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Tom Davis. Thank you for joining. Um, this afternoon is going to be a, a uh, discussion of the RAD Fair Housing Civil Rights and Relocation Notice. Um, we're going to go through some of the highlights of the notice, and uh, I think we'll ha be able to take some questions at the end. Um, and uh, if you have questions, you can uh, raise your hand on the computer. Um, if you do have questions, uh, your computer may not have a microphone to be able to accept your questions, so make sure that you've either called in to the conference line or you type in the question uh, into the uh, uh, into the chat feature uh, when you have uh, questions. So just wanting to dive in and give folks a uh, an introduction to the notice. Um, uh, I'm, this side, yep. um, so I'm sure you've noticed that it's a fairly significant uh, length of document. It's about 80 pages. Uh, I think that as you get into it, you will uh, see that the bulk of it is explaining um, how pre-existing requirements apply in, in large part. Um, so there are uh, not as many uh, new rules or uh, things that are different than uh, the number of pages might imply. But uh, certainly there are some places where there are new things there, and uh, this uh, webinar is intended to sort of highlight some of those. So the, the notice has got uh, two parts primarily, uh, two major parts. Um, the first chunk is on the fair housing and civil rights, uh, really focusing on providing clarity about how existing requirements apply and impact the RAD transaction. Um, there's very little in the fair housing and civil rights framework that is actually a new requirement. Um, the, uh, although there is a lot of information on uh, helping folks understand how HUD looks at the existing requirements. Um, and uh, one of the key pieces of the, uh, uh, the Fair Housing and Civil Rights Framework is that the PHA does still remain primarily responsible for civil rights compliance. So the, the uh, teams doing rent transactions will want to be thinking about these various civil rights issues uh, in, in, doing their, in doing your work. Uh, the second major part of the relocation, uh, the Fair Housing and Civil Rights and Relocation Notice is on the relocation piece. There are more changes to the relocation framework in this context. There are some additional resident protections, um, at which uh, we have also uh, implemented some uh, changes that will make implementation of relocation, we hope, easier. Uh, both easier for the residents and easier for the housing authorities and developer, development teams, um, and then also a fair amount of clarification uh, in that context as well. So diving right into diving right into the notice, and I'm having trouble with my clicker, so there we go. Um, so the, the fair housing uh, and civil rights portion does have a bit of an overview. Um, this is not intended to be comprehensive instruction on fair housing and civil rights requirements, but we have uh, noticed that some of the, the participants in the RAD program are, are not as familiar with what background civil rights and fair housing requirements uh, that apply uh, even in the absence of RAD, uh, what those are. So there's uh, sort of a, a bit of a primer uh, in Section 4 and in Appendix 1. Uh, it's an overview of key principles and sort of a quick reference guide so that people who are not as familiar with uh, the fair housing and civil rights issues uh, can have a sort of entry point to, to where they, uh, and references to where they can learn more. So uh, there's a bit of an overview of uh, fair housing and civil rights laws, an overview of the affirmatively furthering fair housing issues, uh, and then accessibility on both a program and a property level accessibility issues. Um, then the, we, the uh, document also talks about certain ways that uh, there are items specifically ap applicable to RAD um, around eligibility for participation, uh, that kind of thing. Um, 
then a, a pretty extensive discussion of the front end civil rights review, and uh, and then a discussion of the AFUMP, the Affirmative Fair Housing Marketing Plan. One of the things to bear in mind throughout is um, that the the PHA and the project owner and the development team really does need to be thinking through these issues uh, on your own. The the fair the HUD front end civil rights review is a risk based review that uh, the housing authority and, and each housing authority's team is, uh, res is responsible for their own compliance, but there are certain things, certain activities that HUD determined back in the June 2015 notice um, have more risk to them uh, in connection with civil rights reviews and that those are the items that HUD is, is looking at. That risk frame is something that we have fleshed out a little further in the in in this notice. Um, but the fact that HUD is or is not looking at something does not necessarily mean that the housing authority is in compliance with uh, your your civil rights and fair housing requirements. You have to evaluate that uh, locally uh, uh, as well. Um, oh, I see. Um, so, uh, in, in the universe of the, the sort of overview of key principles and, and, and reminders, uh, there is a discussion of uh, that uh, a HUD recipient, independent of its uh, of involvement in RAD, does have the affirmatively fair housing, affirmatively furthering fair housing obligation, the stemming from the civil rights laws of the 1960s. Um, with the requirement to uh, conduct an assessment of fair housing, um, and uh, folks should be familiar with the AFFH rule um, and and thinking about their RAD uh, effort in the in the context of the the full AFFH picture, um, and the notice points you to the the rule and that kind of thing if you need to to dive in further. In terms of the program and property accessibility. Uh, there's sort of the reminder of uh, the existing, pre-existing requirements unrelated to RAD that uh, uh, require attention to limited English proficiency and taking steps to provide information uh, to folks with limited English proficiency uh, so that they have access to the same information everyone else does, uh, communications uh, to folks with disabilities, uh, that have to be effective for people with he hearing and visual and other communications related disabilities. So those are sort of in the um, program accessibility. Um, accessible meeting facilities is something that uh, folks have uh, had a little bit of confusion on. Um, so there is certainly the balance of uh, you, you need to have an accessible meeting facility and uh, also trying to have it in the most integrated setting. So that does not mean um, in order to have an accessible meeting facility, you need to go uh, you know, 10 blocks away to uh, some public building because that imposes a, 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 a distance uh, that is perhaps a burden on other folks. So uh, think about where is uh, integrated and uh, is accessible, so you may be able to think about uh, obviously common rooms, but also are there other spaces in the in the property that may be a more integrated setting that are also accessible, um, and maybe you do smaller uh, meeting sessions uh, in smaller venues and that kind of thing. So uh, just some uh, thoughts and reminders around uh, the, the accessibility issues, um, and the reminders that Accessibility applies to all stages of the process, so the planning process, the uh, accommodations during relocation, for example, um, and uh, just the physical changes that uh, uh, folks think about when they're doing the rehabs as well as during the any planning and relocation uh, time frame. Uh, so the PHA site selection is, uh, as you all know, something that has gotten a lot of discussion um, since the June 2015 notice came out. Um, there's the reminder that the PHA needs to perform its own analysis of the site selection criteria, uh, independent of the front-end review. Um, the, uh, the notice tries to be, 
to be clear about what the criteria are. Uh, there are certain provisions uh, that are all, um, uh, there are different uh, reference points for PBV and PBRA. PBRA is in Appendix 3 and PBV is in uh, 24 CFR 983. Uh, certain parts of 983 apply to all properties. Um, 983.57D applies only to existing buildings. Those are uh, existing residential buildings. Um, and uh, 983.57E applies to new construction, uh, which is also uh, uh, a, a, uh, an adaptive reuse would fall in that new construction territory. So um, it may not be from the ground up new construction, but if you're uh, converting a, uh, a warehouse into residential building, that uh, would be viewed as, as new construction. So also in the PHA's background responsibilities around site selection is a, a compliance with the existing Section 504 rules. Um, Section 504 may not be sort of front and center on people's minds as they are thinking about a site, but the PHA is subject to that uh, irrespective of whether they are going through RAD. Um, so there is a bit of a reminder of what Section 504 would require, does require. Um, so the, the items about looking at the site features, uh, looking at building features, looking at accessibility to transit and that kind of thing <coughs> are items that Section 504 would require a PHA to consider. Um, and Section 504 also uh, requires a PHA to um, identify areas that are non-compliant with these accessibility things and uh, have a remediation plan for those barriers if you are actually moving forward with that, that particular site. So um, some folks may perceive the uh, statement that the financing plan needs to reflect the, uh, the remediation efforts. Um, some folks may perceive that statement as a new requirement. It's actually fundamentally not a new requirement because if you are subject to 504, you are required to remediate these accessibility barriers, and you are doing a project where the only uh, resources to do that are the resources in the financing plan. It's not a big uh, sort of uh, creation of a new requirement leap to say that um, you, you, uh, that HUD wants you to, to show that the math works and that's part of the, that uh, compliance with 504 is part of your uh, part of your plan. So uh, I would argue that that is not a new requirement. Some of you may take issue with that characterization, um, but there it is. Um, so at the end of uh, doing the PHA's work, uh, the PHA does uh, prepare a certification uh, of, the, of the site selection. And those are the, the steps that the PHA is taking on its own before HUD is even uh, involved. Um, and then we get into the question of the front-end civil rights reviews uh, that were established in the June 2015 uh, notice. So most of this should be very familiar to you. Uh, obviously, uh, new construction in areas of minority concentration. Um, there's a review of the site selection. The June 2015 notice also talks about a review of site selection for transfers of assistance. Uh, for changes in unit mix or occupancy. Um, and then uh, these other items under certain other actions, um, those of you who know the notice backwards and forwards will say, well, these items weren't under the, the list. Um, they actually are there. They're about two or three paragraphs below. Um, they're phrased slightly differently, but fundamentally the 2015 notice um, is requiring a HUD review in these last four items as well. Um, so for, uh, again, that means that uh, it is in the 20, 2015 notice, um, but some folks may perceive these as being new categories of front-end review. Um, I actually don't think that a couple paragraphs later, um, and we've just organized them all together for folks um, here, but uh, you may feel free to disagree with my characterization, but I, I don't believe these last four items are actually uh, new to this notice. Um, 
So in terms of the process for the Front End Civil Rights Review, um, and this is where there is uh, something new, um, we are developing a new uh, RAD Fair Housing Civil Rights and Relocation Checklist. The goal of this document um, is to be really explicit about what you need to submit so that it makes it easier for uh, participants in RAD to organize the information that HUD will want to be reviewing when they're doing the front-end civil rights review, um, easier to know what information HUD is looking for, um, and sort of walks you through uh, the, the submission process. Um, the checklist is uh, broken into two pieces, um, and those two pieces are intended to align with different time frames within the uh, pre-development process so that you're uh, submitting to HUD information about your site selection very early in the process um, before you've gone deep uh, in your planning. But we're not asking at that early stage for information that you won't know at that early stage necessarily. Things like, are you going to need to reconfigure units in order to make an accessible unit or uh, you know, things along those lines that uh, you might know at a very early stage, but more likely, uh, but it's a, those are questions that are more likely to evolve during the course of your pre-development planning. So we've asked for that, that second tier of issues to be on the second part of the new checklist, um, and those issues being, will, uh, are asked to be submitted uh, just before the financing plan, um, with the goal of getting those approved before the financing plan is submitted so that when the financing plan comes in, all of the Fair Housing and Civil Rights Reviews are complete. Um, the uh, new checklist is subject to Paperwork Reduction Act uh, review, so it will be going out for comments. Um, can't predict exactly when, but I'm hoping that it's in uh, the relatively near future. Um, until the PRA is complete, which will take a, a number of months, uh, the current forms, the current uh, FHEO Accessibility and Relocation Plan Checklist, the current templates on the RAD Resource Desk, um, those will still be accepted. Uh, we cannot require the new checklist until it's been approved by um, under the PRA. Um, so that is, uh, so there'll be sort of a transition period in through there. Um, I believe uh, that we can accept the new checklist, um, but we can't require it. Um, so if, the, if you find that the new checklist, once it's out for comment, is uh, an easier way for you to submit information, um, I think we will be uh, j j just check with uh, your TM to be 100% sure, but I think we will be happy to, to accept the new checklist. Uh, but we won't be able to require it of anyone. Uh, so the timing issues, we have moved a couple things earlier in the process um, so that the, the civil rights and fair housing issues are resolved uh, before, uh, before the financing plan goes in. I know that there is, uh, I have certainly gotten in uh, conversations over the last few days, questions about whether that's going to delay the the process of completing your financing plan and getting it in. Um, I think that uh, we have also done a fair amount of work to, uh, to make it easier for the fair housing folks to review the material, uh, particularly once we have the new checklist where it's sort of uh, very clear what information needs to be submitted. Um, we have, um, uh, we've also done work to be able to uh, track submissions more uh, tightly, um, and so we are uh, quite confident that the turnaround will, will uh, assuming that you get your materials in with um, a reasonable amount of time to, uh, uh, to review them, that the turnarounds will, will be pretty quick and, and will not delay your uh, financing plan submission. We will be monitoring the, that turnaround time um, to, uh, to make sure that we are not, uh, by, by requiring approval before financing plan, uh, we need to be making sure that uh, that approval process is, is not holding up your transactions. So we will be monitoring that. Um, so 
let's dig in for a bit to new construction, which is the site selection rules uh, around new construction. Uh, the background rule is that uh, new, cons and this was uh, irrespective of uh, the front end civil rights review or not, the background rule is that new construction in an area of minority concentration is only allowed if it meets one of two exceptions, the sufficient comparable uh, housing opportunities, uh, existing outside areas of minority concentration, or the overriding housing need exception. The first obvious question is, is the property in an area of minority concentration and therefore subject to this rule? Um, that analysis looks at the area of the site uh, and compares it to the housing market area. Um, the housing market area is generally the metropolitan statistical area, um, or if you're in a smaller city, uh, smaller metropolitan area, it's the micropolitan statistical area. I personally didn't know that the word micropolitan statistical area existed until relatively recently, um, but it does. Um, and if you're not in, uh, if the property is not in either a metro or a micropolitan statistical area, um, the housing market is the county or the PHA service area, whichever is larger. Um, so that's the, the reference point against which minority concentration is, is used. Um, those standards, metro, micro, and, and uh, county or, or PHA uh, service area are, are longstanding. Um, the comparison of that is the area of the site. Um, so the, the courts have been clear that that can't be a formulaic analysis. Um, the, it, it can't just be looking at the census tract. Uh, the census tract can, however, be a starting place um, for that analysis, but other geographies um, in a lot of situations may be more appropriate. And the PHA, in doing your own analysis um, before it comes into front-end civil rights review, you'll be looking at what's the appropriate area of the site for the comparison purpose, and you'll be doing that more nuanced look. Um, to give you a, an, a sort of illustration of how another area may be a, more appropriate, um, imagine this image is your, uh, your block pattern and all of the grid blocks are a, a flat plane um, that are predominantly lower income, minority, high density. You can imagine, you know, five, six story apartment buildings. And then in this random, this hypothetical city, um, this is actually a map of, a mashup of maps from a couple different Google map screenshots. So this actually doesn't really exist. Um, uh, you've got uh, some, some wiggly streets up on a hillside, um, and uh, that is upper, uh, upper income, lower density hillside lots that are predominantly, uh, uh, predominantly white. If your property is this one little star, you can see that that star is in the census tract that is the uh, predominantly white community, um, but it's actually surrounded by uh, the first of the flat uh, grid uh, grid blocks uh, on the plains uh, at the bottom of the hill, and you know if your property on this star location is a you know five-story apartment building, um, the area of the site may well be much more appropriately analyzed in terms of the two census tracts that are the the grid areas. So that's the kind of uh, the, you know, there, there are even court cases that have said being on the edge of the census block, this property should have been thought about with respect to the adjacent census blocks and that kind of thing. So the, that's sort of an illustration of why um, the, the underlying rule can't be a, uh, a formulaic uh, analysis of just the census tract that the property is in. So. Um, Why is it not advancing? There we go. Um, so the the housing authority does its own analysis, um, and then HUD has, as of the June 2015 notice, said that there is also a, a front end risk review. Um, and as I've uh, mentioned before, that's uh, a risk based uh, analysis. So uh, in order to 
to be clearer about when HUD is going to um, take the time and dig into doing an analysis of a particular site. Um, the notice uh, asks the PHA to submit detailed information about the exception if it meets a couple different categories. Um, and this is, again, just HUD's, when HUD is going to do the front-end review, it's not changing the underlying uh, civil rights law. So obviously, HUD wants to do the front-end review if you all tell us it's in an area of minority concentration. Um, no big surprise there. Um, we have also said that if either the census tract itself is, area, is an area of minority concentration or the census tract surrounded together with all of the adjacent census tracts is an area of minority concentration. And the theory there is that if one of those two frameworks is an area of minority concentration, it's likely that we are going to catch and then have HUD review the vast majority of situations where it's an area of minority concentration. It's not changing the rule, it's just a framework of when HUD is going to look at it. So it gives uh, folks a little more predictability of when HUD is going to be looking at the front end review. Um, and we're actually working with uh, the Office of uh, PDNR Policy uh, Development and Research uh, here at HUD to create a, uh, a, a, a thing on the web where you can type in, I'm not sure whether it will be an address or a census tract, and it will tell you whether you meet one of these two criteria so that you don't have to be chasing down to find your census information. Um, so the, uh, the analysis will then look at these risk parameters of whether the uh, area is minority concentrated, and the reference points there are whether a particular minority group uh, is more than 20 percentage points uh, higher than that particular minority group in the housing market area, so your micro or metro statistical area, or whether the aggregate of all minority persons is 20 points higher than the housing market as a whole. Um, so that's a little confusing, so I'm going to provide a, an illustration. Um, so here you've got a census tract that has it, that is 40% minority, and your housing market area is 24% minority. So that one is not actually 20 percentage points higher than the housing market area. So maybe, maybe not a, an issue, but that by itself uh, is one half of the picture. And then imagine that the that same tract is surrounded by uh, several census tracts, and when you look at them all together, um, the, the grouping of census tracts is 50% minority. So that would say it didn't uh, hit it on the census tract by itself, but it does hit it on the census tract plus all of the adjacent tracts as being more than 20 uh, percentage points greater than the housing market area. So this transaction would be subject to uh, front-end review. The notice does also say, however, that going back to the fact that uh, the analysis itself is not formulaically driven by census tracts, that another geography is more appropriate, and you can make the, the uh, uh, present the discussion of um, that other geography being more appropriate. So, for example, there's a big highway that divides off several of these, and there's an airport just to the south of it, so that it's constraining this neighborhood that you're looking at. And so really the neighborhood that's a more appropriate geography, if there is strong evidence for an alternative geography, um, that's the, the four uh, census tracts surrounded by the highway and the airport, HUD's front end review, you would make the case for that alternative geography, and then HUD front end review, if persuaded that there's evidence for the alternative geography, would look at that instead. Um, so it's a... a, a uh, uh, a risk-based, we're, we're going to look at the first two tests um, and have come to the conclusion that those first two tests will catch the, the majority of situations, the vast majority of situations where review is needed, um, and then certainly the, uh, the housing authority can uh, present the, uh, the case for why a more area-specific uh, geography is, is what should be looked at. There's also been questions about whether the housing market is, is always the right reference point. The vast majority of cases it is, 
Um, but uh, if you think there is strong evidence for an alternative geography, um, you you should uh, consult with with HUD. Um, and uh, uh, so there is uh, openness to that conversation, but I wouldn't say that it's likely to happen uh, in a whole lot of uh, cases. Uh, this is not a, a there is not a sense that the housing market area just uniformly corresponds with the the PHA jurisdiction, which is something that we have heard the the case made for. Uh, if you are in a an urban zone that is surrounded by a, a suburban county that is predominantly uh, not minority concentrated, but the urban zone is uh, minority concentrated, and the PHA has jurisdiction only in the urban zone, that is not a reason to change the housing market analysis. The housing market is still going to look at the metropolitan, urban, and suburban uh, picture. Uh, so then getting into the exceptions. Uh, the first exception is the sufficient comparable opportunities exception. Um, there, are, uh, there are a list of seven factors that are uh, considered. This is the uh, same seven factors that uh, have been considered uh, during the, the last year, before that as well. Um, these are not new. Um, one of the things that is new in the notice is we have uh, offered some examples of uh, things that uh, might, uh, absent uh, contrary information, might indicate that the factor is, is uh, that the housing authority is uh, making good progress on, on one or one of the factors. So the seven factors are all looked at uh, in the totality, um, but uh, we've pr tried to provide some, uh, some indication of how to think about the factors uh, in explaining the, how this uh, exception works. Another piece of this exception is that HUD has decided uh, to establish a couple presumptions. Uh, again, this is going back to the fact that uh, the whole front-end review is a risk-based analysis, and uh, HUD has determined that if you meet one of these two presumptions, uh, we are going to presume that you have met the sufficient comparable opportunities exception and not dig deeper into the, uh, the review of your site selection. Um, so one of the presumptions is that 50 percent of the hard units in the PHA's portfolio are in areas outside of minority concentration. That's an indicator that the PHA has been working on identifying sites elsewhere, working on uh, a, a program of desegregation, um, has done a variety of things that does, uh, is an indicator of sufficient comparable opportunities. Um, and so at that, if, if you meet that presumption, uh, HUD will say, we presume that your analysis of, of the site selection is, uh, is good, and we are not going to dive deeper into that front-end review of site selection. The second presumption is really a very RAD-specific presumption. And this is the idea that um, RAD conversions stemming from a single property um, will actually result in the transfer of assistance and the creation of units outside areas of minority concentration at a, a sort of on par with the units that are being reconstructed on the original public housing site. And this whole discussion, uh, remember, is about new construction. So this is the scenario of you've got a property that is in an area of minority concentration and you are wanting to tear it down and rebuild on the site and you're trying to get uh, to trying to think through whether that's allowed under the site selection rules. So to illustrate that, um, let's say your original site has 50 public housing units, and you're wanting to convert the, uh, convert the site, and on your original site you want to be building 25 RAD units, uh, 20 low-income housing tax credit units, and 15 market rate units. So you're going to reduce the number of public housing slash RAD units, um, but you're going to also introduce some uh, income mixing and in the end actually increase the, uh, uh, increase the density just a little bit. So 
if you are pairing that development with one or two other, in this example, two other developments where you're transferring RAD units to areas that are not minority concentrated, uh, let's say you're moving 15 of them to site A, which is in a non-minority concentrated location, and uh, 10 RAD units to site B, and the 10 RAD units on site B you're also pairing with uh, 20 low-income housing tax credit units. That is an indicator that you're implementing a program to uh, create opportunities uh, that are in non-minority concentrated areas. Site A and Site B are not uh, other sites that meet the exceptions to the minority concentration uh, concern. Site A and Site B are actually non-minority concentrated uh, locations. And if you're doing this kind of a development, uh, HUD will take the presumption that you are implementing this program and, pr and probably others to try to desegregate and provide opportunities that are in non-minority concentrated areas. So you'll notice that um, the, the, the document talks about uh, similarly, uh, similarly affordable housing units. So if you are planning to put 20 LIHTC units on the original site, uh, in order to, to fit in the parameters of this presumption, uh, you would also need to be putting 20 tax credit units on either Site A or Site B. Um, you do not have to be thinking about the market rate units um, in, in terms of this presumption. So uh, this is not by any means dictating that you do these things. This is just a presumption that if you uh, are implementing a development plan that meets the parameters of this presumption, uh, HUD will uh, look at that, verify that, and then not need to to uh, go deeper into the front-end civil rights review of your RAD transaction for site selection issues. So it's, uh, it's also perhaps going to uh, spur some folks to be looking for site A and site B in non-minority concentrated areas, which is also very consistent with the uh, overall policy uh, goal of, of uh, these fair housing and civil rights considerations. So the second exception is the overriding housing need exception. Uh, the regulations uh, define that exception by example. Um, one is an integral part of a local strategy for preservation of uh, uh, the immediate neighborhood. Um, and the notice describes what, uh, what HUD is looking for in analyzing whether you have met this exception. Again, this is not new in terms of what HUD has for many years looked at when analyzing this, um, but it is organized here in the RAD context um, uh, in a way we hope is, is helpful to you in understanding what HUD's review uh, is all about and, and what HUD is looking for in doing its review. Um, so the notice identifies the factors that HUD has historically uh, looked at in evaluating the, the revitalization plan and, and looked at whether the project conforms to the plan um, so example one is, is about when somebody, uh, the, the, an, the municipality or, or some other appropriate agency has established a revitalization plan and is, is working towards it. Um, note that it's about the immediate neighborhood. Um, so it's really about how does that impact the, um, the living experience in the blocks right around the proposed development, not in blocks that are, uh, you know, 20 blocks away uh, in less there's a, a really compelling reason that that might be an immediate neighborhood, which I find a little hard to imagine. But um, uh, the, the revitalization plan really has to have some reason to think that it will change the living experience at the site. Uh, the second example is uh, for a property that's located in a revitalizing area. And this is the example that does not require uh, a governmental action the way the revitalization plan in the first example does. It's really more that the market is shifting or um, the, the community is shifting because of high private investment or reduced crime rates or, or something is going on sort of organically in the community and the community is shifting so that it is becoming a community that is desirable to have uh, more affordable housing in. Uh, so, the, the example one is really more where there's a governmental action, um, and example two is where it's just sort of happening organically. Um, 
NIMBYism is not a reason to say there is an overriding housing need, housing need to locate a property uh, in a minority concentrated area. So uh, that's, uh, the, the exceptions can't be used uh, as, as a fallback for uh, the fact that discrimination is, uh, that, that the housing authority is encountering discrimination when they proposed to uh, cite something in a, in a non-minority concentrated area. So that's, again, a reminder of existing background rules, but it's trying to, uh, throughout this discussion, trying to uh, help uh, sort of organize and, and provide transparency to a lot of the analysis that has been happening for many years when people have looked at these uh, standards and, and how they apply to particular sites. So a large part of this discussion outside of the, the risk frame of things like the presumptions um, is trying to provide, uh, shed light on what HUD is, is thinking through and has been thinking through uh, for a long time on how these exceptions work. Uh, so then the second uh, front-end review item is site selection when there's transfer of assistance. So these are really the items that uh, often transfer of assistance is in the same category as uh, new construction. So if you're transferring a site uh, transferring assistance to a new construction site, um, you would be going through the mental uh, thought process of the front end review for new construction, but you also need to be doing the mental thought process of, of the transfer of assistance itself, which is a much more discrete set of, of considerations. Um, this transfer of assistance uh, analysis is uh, by itself one that you would use when you're transferring assistance to an existing residential building. Um, so again, this is a, a front-end review that was established in the June of 2015 notice. And what we're trying to do is shed light on what the uh, HUD reviewers look like when they're doing, look at, excuse me, um, when they're doing the front-end review of a transfer of assistance uh, that uh, um, is just transfer of assistance alone. Um, so it's mostly about accessibility. Um, there is, they uh, will be looking at uh, relative concentration in the two locations, but it is not the same uh, area of minority concentration test used in the context of new construction. Um, and uh, it's a much more discrete review. Uh, this is separate and apart from uh, the fact that the RAD office, uh, as separate from the front-end civil rights review, also looks at poverty rates in, in the, new, the new location as well. Um, so then the other front and civil rights review items, uh, there, there's the analysis of the unit mix and occupancy. Um, here HUD is really focused on uh, reduction in the number of two, three, and four, four or more bedroom units. Uh, in the June 2015 notice, it just sort of said changes in bedroom mix. Uh, and so we have uh, clarified that the, the risk analysis that we're looking at is a reduction of the larger bedroom sizes. Uh, we're also looking at the reduction in the number of UPASS accessible units, which I hope would be a pretty rare case. Um, the, uh, this risk frame also looks at uh, certain increases in the number of mobility and hearing accessible units. Um, there is some civil rights concern about uh, creating more mobility or more, more units that are accessible for various disability, for folks with various disabilities, than is uh, corresponding to the need in a community because there is risk about trying to create a concentration of folks and steering folks into a sort of uh, segregated environment. Um, the, the goal is uh, having accessible units in as integrated a setting as possible. So the, uh, the risk screen of looking at a higher percentage of accessible units beyond 10% uh, in the mobility framework and beyond 4% in the hearing and vision framework is, again, a risk screen uh, to see whether, the, the, whether a front-end review is needed to make sure that uh, there isn't a, uh, an attempt to concentrate folks uh, in a way that would be contrary to the 
fair housing and civil rights laws. So it's not a change in the rule. It is a uh, it is just an indication of when HUD is going to dive deeper into analyzing uh, uh, the the RAD transaction under the front end civil rights review. So uh, there's also uh, a front end civil rights review as. Uh, you probably know if you're introducing new admissions preferences, uh, concerns are things like converting a family property to an elderly property, which might discriminate against families with children. Um, and uh, the analysis in all of this framework is whether the change in the unit mix or the occupancy type is consistent with the demand for affordable housing in the area. Uh, in the um, in the notice, there is a description of the kinds of information that helps uh, HUD uh, do that analysis. And when the uh, new checklist is available, it will also guide you through what kind of information to submit so that uh, HUD has the right information to do the analysis quickly. Uh, the last little batch of front-end reviews, there's a, a little bit of discussion about uh, front-end reviews uh, in these uh, long-term relocation, if there's a VCA, uh, if there is a 504 concerns, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, there's a, a, some description in the notice about uh, how, what HUD is looking at in those contexts. And uh, as you can imagine, in some, like the voluntary compliance agreement context, it's really going to be a very case-by-case uh, -case, uh, analysis. So, there was, so there's a limited amount of, of how much shedding light we can do uh, in, in some of these situations, but we've tried to, again, shine a little bit of a spotlight on what the, what the thinking process is when folks are trying to do the front-end uh, civil rights review. So the last item that is in the fair housing part of the uh, new notice is discussion of the AFUMP. Um, as before, uh, the AFUMP is required for a PBRA conversion. There's no change there. Um, it needs to be submitted with the financing plan, so again, no change there. Uh, there is a change in that previously the AFUMP was a condition to closing. We were finding that uh, new construction transactions that were going to closing and wanted to start construction were, uh, you know, their closing might be delayed by uh, waiting for the AFUMP approval. Uh, the AFUMP is not necessary for construction, it's necessary for marketing, uh, so we have moved the deadline for approval of the AFUMP later so that it's really tied to when you're planning to start marketing. So uh, it is no longer a condition to closing, which we hope will, uh, in, a, in a few cases, make a difference, uh, make it a little easier for uh, the progress of, of a RAD conversion. So a quick summary of the fair housing side of the new notice. Um, there are, uh, there is the new requirements in process of this new checklist that once the PRA process is complete, we will be requiring the new checklist. Um, so that is uh, definitely new. Uh, we have definitely changed some uh, parameters in terms of timing with an earlier submission requirement for site selection, um, moving that way up to the front of the, the process. Um, also an earlier submission for the other front end reviews. Uh, having that before the financing plan, but not uh, way up at the time of the CHAP. Um, and we've also delayed the approval of the AFUMP to uh, align it with any initiation of marketing activities uh, and not with the closing activities. Uh, for the most part, the rest of the fair housing issues are trying to, uh, fair housing discussion in the notice is trying to provide more transparency around how it works with the front end reviews. Uh, provide explanation of the requirements and some of the factors that uh, are considered, uh, most of those being long-standing existing requirements uh, and a few of them being uh, factors uh, and considerations that we have articulated in framing how the risk-based analysis of the front-end review uh, is going to work, uh, and such as the presumptions and, and the discussion around census tracts and that kind of thing which don't change the underlying rules, but just change, uh, make it clearer when a front-end civil rights fair housing review is, is going to uh, be required and, and uh, when folks are going to be digging into the details of, of your transaction. Uh, so that's the, uh, 
uh, sort of speed overview of the, although for some of you perhaps not speedy enough, uh, overview of the fair housing uh, side of the notice. I think there's a lot of useful information in it. I hope you find that as well. Um, and uh, I don't know if there are any questions on the fair housing side that have shown up. Uh, we'll stop for a few moments uh, for questions on the fair housing side. There's two sort of just questions. Sure. So just there's two related questions about uh, will the slides uh, from this presentation be available for download? Um, and the answer is yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then on the relocation side of things, um, come on. Oh, I have to move that over. There we go. Um, so on the relocation side of things, um, there are actually more changes on the relocation uh, policies that are articulated in the, in the notice. Um, we, uh, here's a sort of little list of the topics that we're going to be covering. Um, the right of return, uh, types of moves, notices, um, initiation of relocation, some record keeping, and alternative housing options. Um, those are all talked about in the notice, and we'll spend a little time today uh, with an overview of them. Um, and then we also, at the end of the notice, there's some discussion about how um, RAD sort of interplays with certain PBV, uh, HCV and uh, public housing rules. There we go. Uh, so underlying all of the relocation, uh, discussion is the core principle that uh, protection of the residents is a, a critically important issue for the RAD program. Uh, that shouldn't be a surprise to folks, but that, that has been a touchstone throughout developing the uh, modifications to the relocation. Um, the, uh, we also want to remind folks of the core principle around permanent involuntary relocation being not allowed. Uh, and also pointing out that uh, these terms um, are used a little differently under RAD than they are in the URA. And the new notice tries to sort of uh, walk that line pretty carefully. Um, but there is a, a concept of permanent displacement under the URA, which is uh, a different concept from permanent involuntary relocation under RAD. Uh, so worth keeping an eye on, on that distinction. Um, we have introduced, uh, and this is new, clearer definitions of the eligibility for protection under the RAD relocation uh, requirements. Um, the, uh, the existing uh, notice, or the pre-existing notice, uh, didn't have a very uh, clean line as to who was covered by it versus who wasn't. So we have articulated that in the new notice. Um, really focused on who was uh, in place at the time of the CHAP or comes to the property subsequent to the CHAP. And that includes folks who are legally on the lease um, and also folks who were in the process of being added to the lease uh, and uh, were in, uh, otherwise in lawful occupancy of the unit. So um, it's, we have taken a, a relatively broad definition of who is eligible for protection under RAD. Uh, given the, the core principle that uh, uh, RAD is really about protecting uh, the residents in the course of these RAD conversions. Uh, so uh, this eligibility for protection definition is different from the URA and, and Section 104D, which is the relocation rules that are applicable for CDBG and home uh, funded projects. So it's worth paying attention to, to that distinction when you're tracking residents uh, going forward. We also wanted to add more detail about how the right of return really works um, so, that, uh, so that people really know what, uh, when the right of return applies um, and, uh, and, and can honor that when, when, they, when you need to. Uh, so in multi-phase conversions, um, it's, it's really focused on returning to the same phase. 
uh, or, or phases that are happening simultaneously. What we're trying to avoid is saying, okay, we're going to relocate you, and you get to return to some phase that's in the hazy, rosy glow future um, that uh, may or may not ever come about. Um, and uh, what we're trying to make sure is that the folks who are dis whose lives are disrupted for the construction work that happens as a result of a RAD conversion, that they're actually getting to benefit from the improved housing quality that, uh, that we're trying to, to get to. Um, we also have some discussion around transfers of assistance. So in general, the right of return is to the destination site. Um, however, there are situations where a housing authority is wanting to move the, tr the assistance because of long-term anticipated needs to, to a location that is really pretty dramatically different from where the household has been, uh, where the family has been living. Um, so if the, the distance to the destination site is really significant, um, the, uh, and, and what is significant is going to vary in different geographies. You know, in, a, uh, in, a, in some contexts, significant may be a much greater distance than, than in others, and we didn't want to be uh, being overly prescriptive in ways that uh, uh, didn't, didn't work across the board. Um, so we, in effect, punted to the vague term of significant. Um, but uh, when it is significant, uh, the right of return does still mean that the resident has the right to move, move to the destination site. Uh, but the housing authority also needs to accommodate the resident in uh, reasonable proximity to the original community, which does not necessarily mean in, the, in a RAD unit. You don't have to eliminate the possibility of doing the transfer of assistance, but you may need to think about, is there another public housing unit that they could move to? Um, can you give them an, a, a housing choice voucher um, and help them find a, a place in that uh, it reasonably proximate to their original community, something along those lines. So uh, transfers of assistance have that uh, extra uh, wrinkle, um, which is a, a new requirement uh, as a result of having really defined what the right of return means in, in the RAD context. We also wanted to be clear about what the right of return means with respect to the unit itself. Um, and the new notice articulates that the, the unit satisfies the right of return if the resident is not underhoused or if it provides the same features as the original, same major features as the original unit. And I think the easiest way to understand that is, is with this example. So you've got a single person household in a three bedroom unit. Their kids have grown up and moved away um, and uh, the right of return you're proposing a one-bedroom unit. That would be the right-sized unit for this household. Moving to a right-sized unit, they are not underhoused. So they are, that is a unit that does satisfy the right to return. Next example, you've got, you, you want to move them back into the unit they were in before. It's a, the three-bedroom unit. Um, and it's not, uh, again, they are not underhoused. You are allowed to move them back into the three-bedroom unit. Um, there is the background rule that you should be trying to right-size them, uh, but if there isn't a, a right-sized unit for them to move into, absolutely, they should go back into the unit that they were in before. The, the third example is the, the, more, uh, the harder example, um, and that's where you have a three-bedroom unit, but the family has grown since they moved in, and they are now underhoused. The issue is whether RAD require, the RAD right of return requires you, in the context of rehabbing an existing building, to create a new unit that is now big enough to accommodate that family. Um, and the answer is no. If you're, uh, you should try to find a way to accommodate the, the family in, a, in a, uh, a size of unit that is appropriate to their household size. Um, we, we would like you to do that. If you're doing new construction, we'd love you to think about that. But in satisfying the, the right to return, you're not required to uh, reconfigure units in a, in a rehab, for example, in order to do that. So that's a case where you would be 
uh, the new unit with uh, three bedrooms, it may be their original unit, uh, has the same major features as, as the unit that they moved out of, uh, and so you're satisfying the right to return. Uh, can we, yeah, okay. Um, so then uh, we also talked a little in the new notice about relocation planning. Um, we have established a requirement that relocation plans, written relocation plans are required uh, for relocation that's anticipated to last more than a year. We recommend a written plan in all other cases, but it is required for uh, over a year. Um, the notice also kind of runs through now that we've been living with RAD transactions for a while. Uh, we know sort of most of the buckets that uh, relocations fall into. And the different buckets uh, trigger different kinds of relocation requirements because of the interplay between the Uniform Relocation Act and the RAD requirements. And it, uh, we have found that lots of people uh, can get a little confused by, by that. So we have tried to um, articulate various different types of moves, um, and we have tried, uh, you'll evaluate whether we succeeded, but we have tried to give a little more clarity uh, on the, the analysis and the rigor of the analysis and what uh, requirements apply in each of these, of these buckets. And regardless of what bucket these, uh, the relocation is in, um, the uh, residents' moving costs have to be covered uh, even in, in some of these buckets, the, the URA uh, doesn't kick in in the same way, uh, but uh, the residents moving costs do need to be, to, do need to be covered. So we're hoping that that dis discussion of the types of moves uh, helps people sort of uh, apply the, the rigor of thinking so that the right uh, rules are applied and we've tried to, to describe that. Uh, we have also had, uh, as the original notice, uh, the, the now by original notice, now I'm referring to the July 2014 relocation notice, uh, articulated a variety of uh, notice to residents uh, that's required. Um, and we did make some changes in that context as well. And we have also uh, added two uh, new notification requirements. Uh, the first is a, a new concept of a RAD information notice. This is a notice that we are going to be requiring for, uh, that we're going to be requiring to be sent to residents in conjunction with the, the resident meetings before the RAD application goes in. So it, it gets sent with the first, prior to the first of the two required resident meetings. Um, it's sent to everybody um, and it uh, we don't yet have it on, on the website, but we will on the RAD website have a, a model of this notice. Um, and it's going to be the a notice that describes what their rights are under RAD. Uh, and you'll see on the next uh, sort of the interplay with this and the general information notice is why we created this notice. Um, in the July 2014 notice, we uh, HUD established the rule that every uh, resident in a RAD converting property must get the general information notice. Those of you who have uh, looked at the general information notice have observed that uh, what it's really talking about doesn't apply in a lot of RAD conversion cases. Um, the general information notice is very focused, for example, on uh, rights when you're permanently relocated, but given the RAD prohibition against permanent involuntary relocation, a lot of that description can be alarming to residents when it doesn't apply. Um, so we have eliminated the requirement that the general information notice be provided to every resident of a RAD converting property and instead have introduced this concept of the RAD information notice, which has information that is much more directly applicable to the RAD situation. When a general information notice is required under the URA, you still have to send it, but if it wouldn't be required under the URA, it's not required as a result of RAD itself. So we have added this notice in an attempt to um, 
really make the notices to the residents, particularly the first communication, first required communication to the residents, more relevant to what their situation is going to be at the time. Um, drawing attention to what rights they do have under RAD, the right to return, uh, the right not to be permanently and voluntarily relocated, that kind of thing, um, and not, uh, not alarming them about things that are not, uh, not in the cards, uh, if you will, in terms of the, uh, what the general information notice uh, talks about. The other new notification we've uh, uh, required in this notice is to let folks know when they're moving back to the property. Um, and that's particularly relevant for folks who have been uh, relocated for a significant amount of time. Um, if you've been relocated for, temporarily relocated for 11 months, uh, we think that it's appropriate to, to give them some heads up about uh, uh, when they should be preparing to move back to, to the original, uh, back to the RAD property. Um, and we've framed it as a notification, not a formal notice. Um, so it doesn't have to be certified mail, that kind of thing. Um, we've also framed it as uh, the deadline is 15% uh, of the time that they have been uh, temporarily relocated, because uh, it would be laughable to uh, say you've got to have 30 days notice when you've just been relocated to a hotel room for two nights. Um, so uh, we've tried to make it not a, uh, a big burden, uh, but also give residents notification of uh, when they are moving back to their to the RAD unit. So then the other uh, notices that are discussed, um, the general information notice we've talked to, I've talked a little bit about uh, already uh, just a few moments ago, uh, but it is a new change in that uh, it's not required. In all cases, it's now only required when the URA would uh, need it to be sent. Um, it's still, when it is required, it's uh, as soon as feasible. Um, and it's really focused on when there's acquisition, rehab, or demolition um, and relocation associated with that. Many PHAs that know that a GIN is going to be necessary uh, would do well to just attach it to the RAD information notice so that both go out simultaneously. Um, and uh, so that may well be the uh, best practice in a lot of cases, but the GIN is uh, not uh, required in all cases the way it has been. The other item that we're introducing is the, uh, we're putting more emphasis on is the notice of intent to acquire. This is an optional notice. Um, you would use it when the ownership entity is changing. Um, it used to be that uh, HUD consent was required uh, to send this notice at various points. Um, now that HUD consent isn't required, uh, we ha have put this framework of uh, you send it uh, within 90 days of your reasonable estimate of submitting the financing plan. Um, that is obviously a, a mushy time frame, um, but uh, if your financing plan gets significantly delayed, then you would need to be thinking about sending the, the notice again. Um, why would someone uh, want to send this optional notice? Um, because it establishes an earlier resident eligibility. Um, you might, uh, for, for uh, protections under the URA, which just begs the question, well then why would you actually want to send this earlier notice? Um, and uh, the answer is because it may affect when you want to send your RAD notice of relocation. Um, the, the RAD notice of relocation is uh, talks about for each resident what their specific relocation plans are. Um, and uh, both in the July 2014 uh, relocation notice and in this notice, um, the RAD notice of relocation uh, can be sent after the effective date of the RCC. Uh, but we have also added in that you can also that you can send this notice after the issuance of a NOTA, NOIA, the uh, notice of intent to acquire, whichever comes first. So this actually opens the door to providing residents notice of their relocation plans earlier than you would have been able to under the existing notice. Uh, earlier relocation notice can also make a big difference for your, the timing of when you can start implementing relocations, particularly if uh, 90 days notice is required. 
uh, you can be working through that 90-day uh, time frame and working with your residents on planning for that uh, uh, planning for the relocation while HUD is uh, reviewing your closing package and that kind of thing, while HUD is reviewing your financing plan uh, so that you can get an earlier start on being ready for relocation. The other big change in this notice is uh, that we are allowing relocation on a blanket basis after the effective date of the RCC. Uh, those of you who have closed transactions before have known that uh, you could not begin relocation until closing. Uh, so this is moving up when you can start relocation, uh, potentially by a couple months. Um, so it gives both, and, and we think that is, that's a, a good move both for the residents and the PHAs in that it gives the, the PHA more flexibility in uh, when they start uh, doing the relocation they are not trying to do the relocation uh, in a super rush between closing and when they start want to start doing any construction work. Um, the, uh, it means that the relocation may be able to happen in a more measured way so that that's uh, good for the residents, that maybe there's more bandwidth to uh, have your relocation counseling team uh, working with the residents individually over a longer time period. Uh, you may have more ability to time relocation so that uh, working with the start of the school year or avoiding uh, the November 20th through December 30th time period, that kind of thing. Uh, previously, when relocation could not begin until closing, uh, the natural tendency of folks is then to want it to be done as soon as you're allowed to start doing relocation. Um, and so we're trying to avoid sort of the, the hurry that the old rules uh, imposed on implementing relocation. Uh, it also, because you can do the, the notice period before, uh, before the RCC, uh, to, while the financing plan is being reviewed, you can start relocation when the RCC is done. You can, um, uh, in, in many cases, um, you may be able to start construction earlier than you would have otherwise. So, uh, in no event can you start relocation before the 30 or 90 day uh, notice period has run its course. Um, but uh, we're hoping that these changes around when you can start relocation will actually make it easier to uh, easier and smoother to implement the relocation process. So we're hoping that this is, uh, makes it uh, a lot easier for uh, implementation on the ground. So we also have uh, some discussion in the new notice about record keeping. Um, we have introduced a requirement to uh, maintain data that would uh, uh, lead to a resident log so that you can give us a resident log on request. Um, what we're basically trying to do is not surprise you about what information we're going to be looking for when we uh, need to do compliance checks. And we will need to do compliance checks. Um, we'll need to do compliance checks uh, you know, whenever there's a problem, but also as a, as a matter of good policy, we will need to be doing some spot checking. Um, and we wanted to be clear with folks about the kind of information that we would be looking for and set it up so that you can be uh, maintaining that all the way from the start and not surprised that uh, we're looking for that information. Um, so yes, uh, it is a requirement, um, but it's designed so that uh, uh, you have the information uh, accessible when uh, folks need to look at it. Um, and it's also intended to make sure that uh, you're thinking yourselves about tracking the right of return and, uh, uh, and most uh, I would think the vast majority of you are already uh, maintaining the information that we're, uh, that we listed out um, as you plan your uh, relocation process, uh, but we also just wanted to uh, be explicit about that expectation uh, in, in the resident log discussion. So the kind of information that we're looking for, most of it is stuff that is either uh, in a rent roll or is in the uh, income certification documentation that HUD already requires. Um, the stuff that isn't in one of those two places is basically tracking where folks move 
in the course of, of relocation. Um, and uh, uh, what relocation options have been offered to them uh, and things along those lines. So uh, we hope that it's not um, a surprising uh, type of information that uh, we would be expecting to look at. Um, and we hope that in the vast majority of, of cases, housing authorities are already keeping this information uh, when, they are, um, when they are honoring the right of return. You kind of have to keep track of folks uh, in order to honor the right of return. So uh, we think that this is uh, a relatively uh, discrete uh, requirement. Um, so the, uh, the next topic that I want to spend a little time with is uh, the offer of alternative housing options. Um, part of the, the purpose of RAD is giving residents more choice. You see that in the requirement for uh, mobility, the choice mobility issues at the end of the, uh, after a year or two, depending on whether folks go PBRA or PBB. Um, and if the uh, housing authority wants to make additional choices available during the course of the RAD conversion, uh, HUD is fine with that. Uh, it is uh, a position that is implied by the phrase no permanent involuntary relocation. Uh, that implies that permanent voluntary relocation is an okay thing. Um, and this notice is much more explicit about uh, that that uh, is an allowed thing to do. Um, so a housing authority can offer alternative options. Uh, those could be uh, housing choice vouchers. It could be home ownership opportunities with a, a down payment assistance program or something like that. It can be whatever is appropriate to the, uh, to the housing authority and the local context. Uh, and the resident can uh, voluntarily decline their right of return, as has been the case until now. The thing that is new, however, uh, is we have uh, established some procedures to make sure that the residents are making an informed and voluntary choice. Uh, that uh, has been, you know, the, the prohibition on uh, permanent involuntary relocation has, has that framework of a voluntary choice. There's been a lot, we've gotten a lot of questions of uh, what do we have to do to make sure that uh, we're not going to get in trouble on uh, uh, someone having made a voluntary choice. Um, and so the discussion of alternative housing options does lay out what, uh, what procedures a housing authority should go through in order to make sure that it's an informed and voluntary choice. Um, and we've also uh, been sensitive to concerns about uh, asking residents to make a decision about something that is uh, so far in the future that it's not really relevant in their current decision making. Uh, so we tried to balance um, the, uh, uh, the resident selection with the ability of the resident to change their mind over time, but not to change their mind uh, so frequently that it's impossible for the housing authority to plan their transaction around that. Um, so we're really looking for uh, uh, we're really looking for a framework in which uh, any any time that a housing authority is making options available to, uh, to folks that are alternatives to the right of return, that they're doing that in a fair way, that uh, similarly situated residents are getting the same, uh, same benefits. Uh, so we're trying to avoid the, uh, uh, I, I remember my economics professor in college saying that, you know, you sort of do what the airlines do if you uh, give 200 bucks to, to take the next flight and then you ratchet it up to 400 bucks for somebody later. We're trying to avoid different residents getting different, uh, different benefit, uh, different options. Uh, so if you do find that later you want to change the alternative options, um, uh, perhaps to uh, encourage more folks to uh, take those alternatives, um, you need to then make that option available to everybody who uh, uh, was similarly situated. Um, and it may mean that you then use a lottery or whatever to decide how many people get a mobile housing choice voucher if you're offering housing choice vouchers, uh, that kind of thing. So the scenarios that we're, we're thinking about are, you know, you're, you're trying to reconfigure uh, units 
to accommodate accessibility or, or to create some common space or something like that, but you only want five households to take you up on this alternative housing op option, you might need to make it available to everybody and then have a fair way of allocating it uh, between folks. Uh, so what does, uh, what do you need to do in order to make sure the, the choice is informed and voluntary? Uh, well, first off, you can't ask anybody to waive their rights under um, uh, RAD or the URA or 104D, uh, particularly with respect to uh, relocation assistance. You can't say, ooh, here's an option if you waive your right under the URA to relocation payments and assistance. Uh, the URA rights are, are not waivable. Um, so whatever your options are have to be on, on top of that. Um, the option, if you're giving folks alternative housing options, you have to give it to them in writing so that they can um, uh, read it on their own and really understand what the choice is. Uh, and you have to remind them of their, uh, of their rights that they do not have to take uh, the alternatives. They, they really do have a right to return and you have to remind them of that. Um, you have to give them uh, some uh, advisory services so that they really understand that. Um, so that, for example, if you're offering participation in a home ownership uh, program, that they really understand that they're now responsible for maintaining the roof long term and, and what that might mean uh, and, and uh, whatever advisory services. Some folks may not uh, need a whole lot of advising. Some folks may uh, really need uh, more help to think through the implications of the options that you're presenting to them and, and you need to make that information available. Uh, and, and, and think through with the residents what the long-term implications are, not just what the implications are for 12 or 24 months out. Um, you have to give them 30 days to think about their options, uh, and they need to accept that alternative in writing, uh, acknowledging that they are um, taking this, this as an alternative. In terms of the committing to something far in the future, um, you can talk to the residents about uh, the alternative housing options, but uh, we have specified that you can't uh, have them commit to anything, uh, ha can't uh, ask them to make a decision until you have issued uh, a NOIA, uh, the Notice of Intent to Acquire. Um, so that's basically saying it needs to be relatively close to the financing plan. You may have talked through with folks uh, what the options are, and you may have a sense of people's uh, inclinations, uh, but we're uh, wanting the, uh, the actual uh, choice point that the residents are exercising to happen relatively close to the financing plan before the financing plan, presumably, so that uh, the housing authority can tweak the financing plan if, that, uh, if the choices uh, impact the financing plan in any way, um, but uh, relatively close to it. Um, their choice is valid for 180 days. Um, that is that balance of uh, keeping an option to not have to think too far in the future and an ability to change their mind, but a, an ability for the housing authority to progress uh, towards closing if you, if you move promptly through getting your RCC and getting to closing. Um, that uh, would happen within the 180 days. Uh, if things are, are taking longer, you'll need to go back to them and have them reaffirm in, in writing that they're, uh, that they're sticking with their original choice. Uh, that doesn't mean another 30 days and everything. It just means checking in with them and having them confirm in writing that uh, that's, that's still the choice that they want to be making. So we hope that uh, uh, by providing some discussion of the alternative housing options that a lot of the uh, ambiguity and questions that people have been asking and, and uh, some of the uncertainty that has been out in the, in the community about how to do this uh, can get alleviated. Um, so uh, it is affirming that uh, as people have understood to date that you can offer alternatives and uh, that people can choose to be permanently relocated, um, but uh, putting a little bit of a frame around that on how it should, uh, how it should work. So the last section of the relocation uh, portion of the new notice talks about some of the interplay between uh, RAD and housing choice vouchers or public housing requirements. Uh, and a lot of these, uh, this is sort of a grab bag of little issues that have uh, confused people in various ways. 
the first is to confirm that uh, the prohibition on early relocation does not mean that you have to tell someone who has been waiting for 20 years to rise to the top of the housing choice voucher list uh, that they can't get a voucher. Uh, the, uh, if a resident comes to the top of the waiting list unrelated to the RAD transaction, they can uh, take their voucher and move and the PHA is, is not in any sort of trouble with the relocation, uh, with the RAD relocation rules. Um, but if you're wanting to use vouchers as a relocation resource, you do need to uh, make sure your administrative plan accommodates that um, and, and has a preference so that, uh, so that you're following your own rules when you're implementing your, your voucher program. Uh, and as a, as a caution, um, once you have given a, a family a voucher, even if you thought it was a temporary relocation resource, uh, once they have a voucher, you can't take it back from them. Um, so if you are using Housing Choice vouchers, as a resource for someone who needs to be temporarily relocated for nine months. Um, at the end of nine, that nine months, don't be surprised if they decide that they want to keep their voucher. Um, and uh, that is, is their right to keep the voucher at that point. Uh, we also talk a little bit about public housing transfers. Um, if they're unrelated to RAD, uh, for example, they uh, need to move to uh, uh, in an emergency situation or something like that, um, they can uh, move uh, under your standard uh, emergency uh, transfers uh, or under your standard uh, resident-initiated transfers policies as, as they exist in, in your uh, local public housing authority rules. Um, however, if the, if the transfer is related to RAD, like the, <coughs> the resident uh, has decided that they don't want to participate in the RAD program and they are wanting to transfer to public housing in order to remain within traditional public housing, um, uh, they can, uh, you don't have to change your, your admissions and occupancy policy. Um, the, uh, that's okay. Uh, they can move without violating the rules on early relocation, but you do have to uh, bear the cost of, of their move um, since it's not a, a resident initiated activity. It's, it's really in response to the RAD program or the RAD conversion. One new thing in the notice is uh, more ability to use public housing units as a, temporarily, as a temporary relocation resource. Um, so those of you who have gone through a RAD conversion so far have perhaps uh, been aware that uh, until now, if you wanted to move someone into public housing, you could do that before closing while they were still a public housing resident and uh, wearing that public housing uh, figurative uh, public housing hat. Um, but once the conversion happened and they became a Section 8 resident, um, move them into a public housing unit because that would be jumping over all of the folks who were on your public housing waiting list, and as Section 8 residents, they were no longer within your public housing uh, program. So until this notice, if you wanted to use public housing as a, as a relocation resource of any sort, those moves needed to happen before the RAD conversion uh, took effect. While we, uh, while we do want to uh, caution folks against uh, you sort of sucking up too much of their public housing uh, portfolio for uh, RAD relocation purposes, um, and you need to make sure that you're keeping uh, units vacant for a re as a relocation resource only to the extent that you uh, really need to, to use that as a, as a relocation resource to facilitate the work. Um, and while you also need to be thinking about uh, the extent to which you need some units available for emergency transfers and Violence Against Women Act transfers or, or things along those lines, um, we have opened the door to using uh, public housing units as a temporary relocation resource uh, post-closing. You do need to be uh, touching base with, with your PIH uh, field office and uh, working through the details of it, however, because uh, we want to make sure that uh, it is not a situation where you're getting double subsidy. You're, uh, 
getting public housing subsidy and the Section 8 subsidy associated with that resident. Um, so uh, there, there will be uh, steps that PIH will uh, need to guide you through uh, in order to make sure that there isn't a double subsidy um, and uh, PIH is working on uh, outlining what those steps uh, would be. Um, but uh, the, it is a new, uh, a new ability to use public housing as a resource for relocation even after closing. So that's a, a new feature of this notice. And finally, uh, we are explicit that uh, the right of return takes precedence over uh, any, uh, any moves to right-size a household. Uh, you do still have the right-sizing obligations, uh, but the right of return comes first. So as a, as a quick summary of, of some of the major changes in the relocation portion of the notice, um, we are trying to be more clear about definitions of eligibility for protection, about uh, what exactly the right of return means. Uh, we have uh, introduced the requirement of a written relocation plan for long-term relocation. Uh, we have introduced the RAD information notice and the notification of return as, as new things. Um, uh, but we have also uh, tried to make implementation of, the, of relocation an easier process. We have uh, allowed earlier relocation. Uh, we have uh, allowed earlier, uh, earlier notification, uh, an earlier time frame for uh, providing the resident notifications. And then you can start implementing the relocation itself earlier in the process after RCC instead of after closing. Uh, we've tried to be clear about uh, what the expectations are around resident relocation um, and have created the requirement that you maintain the data so that you would be able to produce a log for us uh, if we do need to do a compliance review. Um, we have uh, been explicit about the, uh, the pre-existing uh, authority to offer alternative housing options, but we have added a uh, framework around the resident uh, protections that uh, you need to, to implement in order to, to do that uh, and ensure that uh, the households are making an informed and voluntary choice. Uh, and then finally, we've uh, added the ability to use public housing units for temporary relocation. So I think those are some of the, the big features. Uh, we hope that it's hitting a, a good balance of protecting the residents, but also making it uh, easier to implement the relocation, to, uh, uh, to know what the parameters are for uh, offering other alternatives, uh, easier to implement the relocation in the timing of how you uh, roll out the, the relocation itself. Um, and uh, we think there are some, some features here that uh, will just make the, the relocation process uh, work more smoothly for, uh, for the development team implementing the, the RAD conversion. So I hope that this has given you a little bit of, of a orientation, perhaps, to the new notice. Um, I appreciate your, your, your patience uh, with the, the extent of it, but we think that uh, the, um, the new document uh, gives a lot of uh, detail and information that people have uh, been needing as they are implementing both the, the RAD conversion generally in terms of fair housing and civil rights uh, requirements, in terms of implementing the front-end reviews that were established a year and a half ago, uh, and implementing uh, the relocation and uh, making some tweaks to the notice that uh, existed in, uh, in, uh, since July of, of 2014. So I'm going to stop there and turn to questions. So who's the... Okay. Uh, this is Dan Gordon at HUD. I'm going to call on folks. Um, Kristen Larimore, you're on the line. Hi there. Um, this may or may not be the right form for this question, but if we have... So we're dealing with uh, 
two RAD conversions currently. Actually, one uh, has already gone to closing, and they've started um, relocating residents within the community uh, for renovation purposes, and the other is about to go to closing. And the question is, in the event that we have a, a current resident on the community that has already closed and is undergoing um, construction, if they want to temporarily relocate to another RAD community, um, we are required to get our, our applicants from a public housing waiting list. Do you know as far as Uniform Relocation Act, um, would that resident take any, any preference in moving, I, I want to say to the, the top of so a waiting list? Or, because technically they would it would be like a like a new move in because there's you know no transfers really from one community to another. Yeah, so um, I think your your question really gears more towards what are the um, the admission requirements in the uh, the other rad property that um, you're already taking units off of a site based waiting list or whatever it is. Um, so that really goes to um, uh, adjusting the uh, the admissions rules at that site um, more so than whether uh, what the relocation rules are. Um, when you're moving into wh wherever you're placing a household is as a temporary relocation resource, um, mm -hmm. the the apartment community that you're placing the household in uh, may have admissions requirements and screening and that kind of thing, and you need to be making sure that your household uh, fits the requirements of that destination community, which is not really about the relocation rules, it's about the rules of the place that they're moving into. Um, so does that answer the question? Well, so both communities are, so they're being purchased from the housing authority for a RAD conversion. So. The housing authority is the monitor of the waiting list. So any new folks that we take in have to come from the housing authority waiting list. So I guess my question would be, since this person obviously is already in a property that was formerly owned by the housing authority during the RAD conversion, they're not on the waiting list. So I didn't know if, if the Uniform Relocation Act would maybe protect them as far as putting them in in front of anybody who was already on this waiting list. So you would need to be talking with the housing authority about the, the rules okay. for the waiting list. Got the it. URA does not trump the, uh, does not overrule the, the waiting list requirement. The URA is really focused, and the URA and the RAD uh, relocation requirements are really focused on making sure that the resident, uh, that you take care of the resident in a temporary uh, housing context it, it doesn't uh, give sort of a, an override to the uh, to the rules of the of the property where you're trying to move the resident to. But um, you might well be able to talk with the housing authority about tweaking the admissions uh, waiting list to give a preference for folks uh, coming off, a, you know, being relocated as a result of a rad, of another rad transaction. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Okay, great. Okay, uh, Leanne Smith Rosenberg, you're on the line. Hi there. Um, I have a question about the applicability of this notice and the opt out or the 60-day open period for PHAs to ask to be included under the old notice. Yep. Um, what does that process look like? Uh, and do tenants have a say in whether or not? you know, they can contest and ask that they be governed indeed by the new notice. So for the uh, background of folks who have not yet uh, read the, the notice in as much detail as you have uh, at this point, um, there is a, a discussion about how the transition works from the old notice to the new notice. Um, and basically the new notice is, effect, is effective immediately, but a housing authority can request to be covered by the old notice uh, with respect to uh, a, a feature of the new notice that is troublesome to them. Um, 
that is a request from the Housing Authority to your RAD Transaction Manager. Your RAD Transaction Manager will then uh, circulate it uh, within the Office of Recap, um, and uh, you'll get a response uh, at that point. Um, it's a, uh, a direct request from the Housing Authority. So there isn't a structure of a of uh, uh, there isn't a requirement of uh, resident consultation in uh, in doing that. Will residents be put on notice when such request has been made, and will is there any opportunity for residents to voice concern in that process? Um, it has not been structured in to do that. Um, I don't know. I, I guess you're you're anticipating something that you're worried about that you want residents to be concerned about, and I guess that we hadn't uh, envisioned uh, that scenario as carefully as we perhaps should have. Uh, what are you, what are you what kind of thing are you worried about? Um, just generally that there are already concerns about relocation, um, and and there are, there are a lot more specific and clear guidance in the new as opposed to the old and seeing a preference potentially from residents to be governed by the new because there are such, so much more specific details. Yeah, um, certainly when we're reviewing the, the request, we are going to be trying to figure out why the Housing Authority is asking for it. Um, and uh, so certainly the resident protection is uh, something that we would be, uh, you know, cautious of. Um, I think that uh, uh, you know, I think that we, I, I know that we did not want to make this a, a, a big process of, uh, of the transition. Um, you know, our choice was either to make it effective immediately or delay the effective date for 60 days or something like that, and we decided that the, the benefit to the resident was was greater by making it effective immediately than having a delayed effective date, um, and we uh, we decided that the um, you know the, that the housing authority asking for in effect the delayed effective date uh, was no worse off for the residents than just simply a, implementing a delayed effective date. So we actually sure. did think of this as the the way to be as protective of the residents given the options but we did not want to uh, create a lot of process around this. Okay. Thank you. All right. So next question. Let's see. Uh, Roseanne Pissam, you're on the line. Um, I think you answered my question already. Thank you. It was about the retroactive effect of this notice. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a couple. We have a couple folks whose hands are raised, but uh, it doesn't look like they'll be able to. Just try and see. So we'll try, try, try it and see. Yeah. So the concern is, uh, if your hand is raised and you have not called into the conference call line, we're hoping that your computer has a microphone because if it doesn't, we won't be able to hear you. Um, but uh, so if if uh, if there's a great silence. Um, that's that's the problem. So who's the first one? Okay, Shanta Barrow, you're up. Shanta, can you uh, can? Okay, sounds like Shanta, you you may need to call into the conference line that's on the invite um, and then raise your hand again, or you can type a question. Or you can you type, type a question. We'll get, we'll get to the type questions uh, as soon as we're done with these. Okay. Um, Nathan Joseph, you're up. Um, the, uh, just a, a little more clarification on applicability. A project that has a CHAP but has not submitted a financing plan, the uh, relocation provisions are effective immediately. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. What if you received your RCC? Um, I, I think they're effective then as well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the the relocation, unless there is something that you know you've received your RCC and there is some uh, element of the new notice that uh, complicates your getting to closing, um, in which case you would uh, write a letter to your transaction manager or your closing coordinator and say we'd like to not have this particular thing apply. 
um, the the notice applies across the board. All right. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to read a few of the written questions now. Okay. First one is from Angela Lindsay. And the question is, if a RAD household has an adult member or members who would like to have their own unit while exercising their right to return, are they able to receive a separate unit as a member of the household and the head of household receive their own unit as well if there is availability in the new construction project? Since all household members are protected, are they able to exercise this option? Yeah, so all, all households are protected. The right of return assures that they can, uh, as a group, move into the new, um, uh, return to the RAD property uh, in, in the household configuration that they were in before. Um, certainly the, uh, the, the background framework is, uh, you know, PPV and PBRA have a framework for splitting households and that kind of thing, and that would apply. Um, so the, if, if there is a, if there are new units available, um, that, that background rule under either the PBV or PBV program would apply, and uh, the housing authority may well uh, be able to accommodate that. Uh, we would like them to be able to accommodate that. But that's uh, a background rule that is not part of the right to return. The right of return is uh, in the household configuration that they currently have. Uh, we have another question from Angela. Uh, if a RAD project has started and the entire property received the GIN notice but the project is in phases, would you recommend providing the two new notices to the residents in each upcoming phase? Uh, I mean, certainly I always recommend making sure that the households are uh, aware of their rights. Um, so it certainly would be a, a best practice. Um, and I would recommend that the Housing Authority uh, communicate that uh, information. Um, the requirement is a, uh, is a one time before the application requirement, so a, uh, a, a property that uh, has already had its two resident meetings uh, would not be required to do that, um, but we certainly would recommend that they uh, make folks aware of their rights. Okay, okay. this one's from Shantabarrow, I guess, who had typed in before we had uh, tried to get your line going. Welcome back, Shant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, new, new to relocation, at what stage again can we start with relocation, after or before the RCC? I think so the, under the new notice, you yeah. can now, uh, your, your notifications to residents can happen before the RCC if you've issued a notice of intent to acquire. And the actual moves can begin um, on the later of the RCC or the expiration of the 30 or 90 day notice period. So. Um, the, the short answer is you can start people moving uh, after the RCC, but you need to have made sure that the 30 or 90 day notice um, has run its course before you actually move people. Next uh, from Nathan Joseph. Uh, is the provision that relocation can begin as of, R as of the RCC effective as of November 10th? Yes. Okay. Okay, we have a question, let's see, from Hillary uh, Annapol Annapolo, Apoyo. Um, hold on, it's a long one. So if the right of return comes before right sizing, does that mean that we must first allow the resident to return to their former unit if they so desire, and then sometime after that, issue them a notice to transfer to a right size unit when one becomes available? Uh, no, you can do both of those in a single step, and the right of return uh, is uh, is directly into the right-sized unit. Um, so that uh, going back to can I go backwards on these? Yeah, I'm um, here. 
I would probably have to do it. Okay. Do you remember, go right. back to the slide with the examples, the three examples in the box, the blue box at the bottom. That one. Um, so the question is really asking about the, the first row. Uh, let's say you have a single person living in a three-bedroom apartment. Um, you can move that household when they are doing when when they are coming back from temporary relocation. You can move them directly into a one-bedroom unit, achieving both the right sizing and the right of return into a, a unit where they're not underhoused. Um, and uh, you do not need to do it as a two-step thing. But you could return a one-bedroom per a one-bedroom to a larger unit if that was all you had. That's right. Yeah, so the uh, right size at a later date. That's right. So if if your one bedroom, if you don't have any available one bedroom units when the household is moving back to the site, you could return them to a larger bedroom unit, uh, and then at some future date uh, implement the right sizing when the one bedroom comes up. Obviously, you would. It's better to do it as a single step so that the the family is not having to move and move again. Um, and all of the disruption that that entails. Uh, so it's uh, uh, so you would definitely try to do the right of return and the right sizing in one step. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Sherry King, or two questions uh, specifically related to acronyms. And uh, there's always always a lot to keep straight. Is there is there a, a, a thing on the resource desk would be a good a good resource for you know, having all the acronyms? We do have acronyms, but uh, don't know that we've incorporated these yet, so we will. Uh, yeah, the, so the resource desk has a list of acronyms, but it hasn't necessarily caught up with this notice. Um, in this notice, um, uh, all of the, I think all of the acronyms are defined at some point in the text of the notice. Um, I believe the notice is on the uh, web in a Word format, so you could search for the acronym I know that that's not the easiest answer, but uh, we're getting there. Um, and uh, the acronyms here will be added to the acronym list on the RAD Research Desk. Okay, great. And I, I do see that uh, Maxine Sanchez has, uh, has had her hand up for a while, but uh, it doesn't look like we have any way to, to hear you. So I don't know if you uh, checked well, your question, but that would be the way to get your question answered. Uh, okay. From uh, Roseanne, who I think we tried to to listen to earlier, to what extent are any of these new rules retroactive? They are effective as of the issuance date. Um, they are not retroactive. Okay. Okay, this one's from Carmen Rentas. Uh, does the RIN have to be sent certified mail? I think we said yes. I'm trying to remember that detail. Um, it's a notice, so I think yes. It has to be sent like what the gin would have been sent, so certified mail or uh, hand, delivered. hand delivered with a receipt. Um, Signed by the head of the household. Yeah. Okay. okay we have the, the notification of return does not have to have that procedure. Okay, we have a question from Karen Schrammel. As with most HUD programs, there is a lot of information to keep up on. It's great to have all the notices and regulations, but with, um, but with so much to read, it's hard to know if anything is missed. Is there a checklist of steps to follow so steps aren't overlooked or remembered late in the process? So that's a perpetual challenge for us. I, I am sympathetic. Um, we, there is, on the relocation side of the notice, there's sort of a summary chart at the beginning um, that uh, um, may, may provide some of that. There, it's not necessarily a, an exhaustive checklist. Um, checklist. The new checklist on the, 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 the draft that you haven't seen yet yeah. <laughs> of the new checklist um, does, um, certainly on the fair housing side of things, um, guide you through some of the material that needs to be submitted. Um, and the relocation side of things does have some questions about uh, have you 
uh, issued the RIN and that kind of thing. Um, so there are some places where uh, where there's some guidance along those lines, but I don't think we at this point have a sort of an exhaustive checklist. Um, we'll consider whether that's something that we can put together, but it's not something that we have uh, on the on the resource desk right now. Okay, we have another question from Carmen Renta. Uh, does the NOIA apply if the new ownership entity is an instrumentality of the PHA and the PHA originally owns the property? So yes, you may issue the, the NOIA is an optional notice, um, and it can be issued any time there is a change of ownership entity, which would include a transfer from a PHA to an instrumentality of the PHA. So it's, uh, it's optional, um, but it, it can be used in, a, in the vast majority of cases. Uh, I see we have a hand raise from Karen Morris, but that doesn't look like we have any way to unmute your line. So, Karen, please uh, please type your question, and we'll uh, we'll get to it. Or call into the phone number. Right. All right. This question is from uh, Trinessa Sydney. Uh, can the family refuse to move to a right sized unit after returning to the project? The right sizing rules are a requirement of the, both the PBV and the PBRA. Uh, programs, so that's a, a background rule that they would be subject to. Okay. So, so I think we'll take like one or two more questions. Um, but uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance, um, we are going to be scheduling Q and A's for the next several weeks, um, and uh, those will be advertised in a red blast uh, if they haven't been already. Have they? they? Uh, uh, I don't believe they have been at okay. yet. Yeah, so they will be advertised in Red Blast. Um, we will be having them every two weeks, I think it is. Two weeks. We're going to try and do two before the holidays and at least one after the holidays. Um, so we'll be having a sort of open mic uh, Q&A, not quite as entertaining as a lot of open mics, but um, we will be available for those questions uh, ongoing. But we'll take two more, uh, two more now. Okay, this one is from Hiram Roman Cintron. Uh, this is a scenario. In the case a natural disaster occurs and some RAD project, uh, new construction units proposed for closing next year get significant damage, does the entire community, uh, are they required to relocate or just the affected families? I think that may be a very site specific uh, analysis of, of how much the damage affected the, the other households. I would think that uh, the relocation would be constrained to some extent to those who are impacted by the damage, but I think that that's a, a, a question that really should be answered in a more uh, thoughtful way in conversation with your transaction manager. Okay. Okay, we can get uh, one more. Uh, last question will be from Lucy Leslie. Under RAD, if the resident is overhoused at the time of conversion but later has a change in family composition, can we transfer them? Sorry, so they are overhoused at the time of conversion. Correct. Um, so in effect, the second row on the screen. And, the, and what's the but later has a change in family composition, can we transfer them? Later as in after closing? It just says later. So um, not sure I'm totally catching the nuance in the question. Um, so um, certainly uh, later as in after conversion. After conversion, um, uh, certainly transfers after conversion can happen. Um, the, uh, uh, I think that's less of a relocation question than just a implementation yeah. of the PBV yeah. and PBRA yeah. rules. Right. But if there is a temporary relocation um, and, uh, you know, the household has moved off the site and is coming back to the site um, and we're talking right to return and relocation, then they could be, uh, the right of return is to a unit that satisfies one of these two rules that either they are not underhoused um, or that it provides the same major features. So I think that uh, if I'm understanding the question right, 
in the end, you can transfer to right size uh, in, in either scenario. So I'm hoping I got the scenario right, but uh, I hope that helps. So, um, OK, so uh, we will have uh, more Q&A options uh, later. Uh, you can also always um, uh, submit, uh, can you go to the last slide? Uh, submit questions to uh, the resource desk. Um, uh, to rad at hud.gov, um, and uh, 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 so you can email questions to rad at hud.gov. You can find uh, the notice, obviously many of you already have the notice, um, at uh, the, the RAD website, um, and uh, thanks very much for your attention. I appreciate your uh, putting up with a long, relatively dry presentation, and I hope it was useful. Thanks so much. Thank you.